Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have a story where a riot grenade made hydrogen cyanide in someone's pocket. In contrast to most of the stories here, my high school AP Chem teacher was very smart and talented. During summer break, she would assist in research at one of the best research schools in the country. She was overqualified for our school to say the least. One day, she told the class a story about radiation. A grad student was demonstrating how to use a machine that uses blasts of high energy radiation to image particles. I think I was too inexperienced at the time to understand why. The guy using the machine must have had a bad day because he managed to bypass all of the security measures on the machine and had part of his hand on the part that emitted radiation. His hand caught the blast. Over the next few weeks, his pinky and ring finger turned black and rotted along with a chunk of his hand. The teacher didn't know what happened to him after that. That is really scary and this is why we often have security measures in place. If you have any similar stories about radiation gone wrong, I'd be interested to hear them in the comment section. Not my own experience, but definitely worthwhile to share with you. Once, a well-known professor emeritus, which just means a retired professor, gave a biochemistry lecture series at my institution. He told us a story from his lab back in the 1980s. Back in those days, microwaves were not affordable, so they used a water bath for melting egg roast to prepare gels for nucleic acid electrophoresis. Therefore, this water bath was heated to 70 degrees Celsius over the course of a day. Of course, some water evaporates, although the whole thing is covered by a lid. So from time to time, somebody had to fill in new water in the evenings. Additionally, a tiny spatula tip of sodium azide was added to the water to prevent the growth of thermophilic microorganisms or any other biological stuff. So that one day, one of the technicians opened the lid of the water bath and immediately lost consciousness, falling on the floor like she got hit by Vitaly Klitschko. Luckily, the mentioned professor was also present in the lab and witnessed the scene. Being warned by a terrible smell in his nose, he held his breath, rushed to the technician, and pulled her out of the lab. They managed to evacuate the lab without any casualties or long-term health issues, but had to shut down the entire building for several days till the military decontamination team of the Chemical Warfare Response Unit gave their okay. Later, he was asked by the professor how much sodium azide he had put into the water bath. The new undergrad student replied plainly and simply, a couple of spoonfuls. That's a lot of sodium azide. That's a lot more than I would want to work with, and I'm assuming that they only had to put in a few grains to keep stuff from growing in there. I've never heard of sodium azide being used to prevent the growth of microorganisms before. Maybe this is just a practice I'm not aware of, and it's actually really commonly done. Me and my friend have lab work together. I was still waiting for an oven to reach temperature and basically had nothing to do. She had autoclaves full of different acids that came out of the oven earlier, so I decided to help her out by loosening the screws so I can hand them over so she can open them in the fume hood. They were almost at room temperature, if I had to guess they were probably 5 degrees celsius above room temperature, so they are safe to open, or so I thought. As I start with a fourth screw on the first autoclave, I start noticing the color of the room change as if a cloud had moved in front of the sun. Turns out this particular autoclave was the one with nitric acid, and the slight difference in temperature was enough for the gas to slowly get pushed out. I realized it was nitrogen dioxide too late, because I got a whiff of it before I chucked that thing into the fume hood. This happened a few hours ago and my nose and throat is still dry. I don't understand why people need to use autoclaves for stuff with corrosive acids. There hasn't been a context in my research where I've ever needed to use an autoclave at all. And the only other time I see people frequently needing autoclaves is in biological applications. If you have some information about why people would be using high pressure and temperatures for nitric acid, I'd appreciate it if you could let me know in the comments. I was walking through a process lab several years ago where the GCs were using packed columns with hydrogen carrier gas. A GC is a gas chromatograph, and it just helps separate different molecules based on their boiling point and their interactions with a column. To push these compounds through, they still need a carrier gas, so that's often helium or hydrogen. But hydrogen can be problematic, as you're about to find out. A packed column is typically 1 8 of an inch diameter and 6 feet long. Somehow, as this was an ancient analyzer, it didn't monitor for leaks. The column had broken and about 20 milliliters per minute of hydrogen had leaked into the oven and pooled there, and was ignited by probably either a relay or the fan motor. So this is just mixing hydrogen and oxygen in the oven of the GC, which is not great. Next thing we know, there was a loud BOOM, and a formerly square box was acorn shaped. Fortunately, nobody was hurt but we all jumped, and the old GC, although thoroughly broken, held together well. I'm curious if you mean that the GC was still functional after this, but I can imagine that a very sensitive piece of equipment such as this would not have tolerated a hydrogen explosion too well. I'm glad to hear that nobody was hurt though. This is today's big story. This is from Opossum, and Opossum is an active member of the Discord community. Five years ago, I had a fun training accident with burning CS gas where I breathed in comical amounts of burning hot CS gas, got hydrogen cyanide poisoning, and exposed to comical amounts of benzene. Here we have the structure of CS gas. CS gas is also known as tear gas, and this is quite often the active component of tear gas. At the time, I was serving as a chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear warfare officer on active duty in the US Army. The acronym for this is called Seaburn. I was supporting a live fire training event where during the final phase of targets popping up, we deployed several artillery simulators and four CS riot grenades. 
so the training audience had to react to indirect fire, a chemical attack, and engage targets. See photo one. Here you can see a marine in a room full of tear gas. A bit about CS gas, or 2-chlorobenzalmalononitrile, it's a common riot control agent used liberally in training by the army. It's spicy air, and the antidote is 2 minutes of fresh air and it's non-persistent, and effects, while uncomfortable, are minor. The CS riot grenade is a softball-sized rubber ball with a grenade pin, and a slide safety to keep it from going off. See photo 2. Another thing to note about CS is that it's very hard to burn. The combustion window is very narrow, but when it does burn it releases benzene and hydrogen cyanide. Here's a picture of what the riot grenade looked like. I thought it was really cool that he had pictures of these, by the way. So we had done three days of training, with six iterations completed with no issues. We go to do the next iteration. I prepared the grenades as I have every time. I take my first one, pull the pin to make sure its safety is engaged, and rest it into one of the pouches. Take the second, deploy it, and then go to throw the first. After throwing the second one, somehow the first grenade has started going off in the pouch of my chest rig. This is really bad because it's a confined grenade. Don't have my mask on, so the hot CS gas is getting blows straight onto my face from my chest rig. After about a second, it combusts. I'm trying to get it off my chest rig as I'm choking on CS gas and trying to not burn my face. My battle buddy gets my rig off me and I collapse to the ground coughing and about to pass out. I can feel CS crystals on my eyes and mouth. My battle buddy can see the crystals all over my coat and burned up chest rig. See photo 3. Here's a picture of his pouch. You can see all of this black smoke is from the grenade combusting. And normally it wouldn't get that hot and combust, but because it was confined, it wasn't able to cool off and it got hotter and hotter as the grenade performed its function. Somehow I don't pass out, but come very close. The medics cut me out of my uniform and dump a gallon bucket of hot water on me to get the CS off me before being brought into the aid station to have my eyes flushed out with an IV bag. I begin to show symptoms of hypoxia when I get super pale and my fingers and lips turn blue. I had to explain to our physician's assistant that hydrogen cyanide is made when CS burns and that I'm suffocating at a cellular level. They put me on a high flow of oxygen until I looked human again before sending me to the local hospital. For the next week doing anything, even just walking across a parking lot had me winded and exhausted, and it was about a month before I could run good again. For the next two years, any time I went to the field, my chest rig would off-gas and I'd get a taste of the spicy air again. And to top it off, the Veterans Administration tried to say my respiratory issues that I got are not service-related, lol. To find out that training is done with live active rounds was really surprising to me. I know you might say, well, it's just tear gas, but you can see that confined tear gas is not just tear gas. If it starts combusting and making hydrogen cyanide, that's pretty scary. I'm glad to hear that you made it out all right, but it's unfortunate to hear that you have long-term health consequences as a result of this. Thanks again for sharing the story, Opossum, and I look forward to sharing more of your stories in the future. Not a chemist, but a molecular biologist here. This is over 10 years ago now. My high school biology teacher was a bit of an interesting character. They had a preserved human fetus, an army of captured cockroaches at their disposal, and kept several literal skeletons in the chemical storage closet. Despite being an elite school in the area, the school was overstretched and underfunded. That meant no goggles, gloves only on one hand per person, and no coats. We had no fume hoods, and windows were occasionally cracked open. There were two doors in the room. One led to the open-air lunch courtyard, and this was the only one that was ever opened, in the second half when lunch was over. Since many of the procedures were questionable at best, and would have brought over administrators thanks to the fumes. They encouraged the use of xylene to clean surfaces. We had microscopes, and xylene is used for cleaning glass slides, so the presence of xylene at the benches made plenty of sense. However, I can't help but wonder why they would use this, when it impaired our judgment due to the enormous amounts of fumes and isopropyl alcohol was cheaper and more readily available. Xylenes can cause what's known as sleepy solvent syndrome. The first incident was when we lost snakes and a couple of rogue cockroach prisoners in the chemical storage closet. The snake took about five days to find, and it was found in a cabinet hungrily curled around the mercury thermometers. The second incident was when we did the Williamson ether synthesis. Among them, methoxybenzene, which we are encouraged to whiff, not waft, with the windows closed. Our brilliant teacher decided to light a Bunsen burner on the other side of the room. The students knew better and scrambled to open every door and window in the most coordinated action I've ever seen from a group of American high school students, and we somehow avoided a disaster. We made sure to open the windows for every experiment after that. I'm now happy to work in a place where safety protocols exist. Yes, this high school sounds like an absolute nightmare, and the fact that your teacher was so cavalier with this is definitely concerning. I remember a couple of years back when I was in college. We were in our first day of composite structures lab, and that day our regular professor wasn't in, so we had a substitute. We were making large fiberglass blocks, and since epoxy gives off strong vapors, we needed to buy our own respirators rated for the fumes. This seems like a massive red flag. Half of my class ended up buying the wrong filters, so I addressed it to my professor. 
He said it was fine, and we proceeded to start making our fiberglass. Lo and behold, an hour into class, my classmates that had the wrong filters started to pass out and collapse. One of them passed out in the bathroom. Thankfully, no one suffered any serious injuries, and it taught us all a lesson to use the proper filters for the right job. I don't think this should really have been done outside of a fume hood. I have never heard of a situation where students needed to buy their own gas masks for a class before. Make sure you're always fit tested for a respirator. Today's Yikes Awardee is someone whose name I can't pronounce because I don't speak Japanese. Sometimes I'm happy that the most deadly things I have to deal with is a pressurized gas fire suppression system. A short story on how CO2 suppression systems work. Inert gas systems are not typically used in areas where there's people. If a fire starts at something like a power station, an alarm will sound and you have 5 minutes to evacuate the area. When the 5 minutes has passed, multiple high pressure streams of carbon dioxide will be released into the room, forcing almost all of the existing air out of the room, leaving only carbon dioxide. The stream of CO2 also creates a pretty dense white cloud, blocking vision. The system is obviously deadly if you don't evacuate in time, which also corresponded to our team finding a very blue corpse in a substation that triggered its system. We never knew how or why the technician was unable to exit the room. By the time we did reach there, there was nothing we could do, and the ambulance announced DOA. Sorry to hear your team had to deal with that. This is a good opportunity to give everyone a reminder that if you have an active fire suppression system, that you do evacuate as quickly as possible, and that you know the possible risks associated with that system well in advance. And if you're in a position to train people, make sure that that's well understood and that there's no assumptions. Because if you assume that they understand, they might be assumed DOA. Ah yes, the neglect method of pedagogy, a favorite of old people who learned their lessons the hard way, so their students should too. I'm almost surprised at the prevalence of abject recklessness amongst faculty. But then I remember, they are H sapiens. Does the H stand for hazard? I hope you've enjoyed this episode. Let's hope that we're not hazardous sapiens. And I hope you have a great day.